Holy shit, I know I'm excited. Well then, without further ado, let me welcome to our stage your first performer, Mr. Kevin Manley, who found his way to live storytelling because he needed a break from stage acting. He also loves making films, and his videos have literally tens of views on YouTube. Please welcome Kevin Manley. When my wife and my mom went to the grocery store, I gave it like 30 seconds, and then I ran to the front door, looked out the window to make sure that the car was out of the driveway. I turned around and bounded up the stairs three steps at a time and ran into my dad's office. My dad was downstairs sleeping, so, and he, there was no way that he was waking up. And I moved quickly from the bookshelf to the, my dad's desk and his desk drawer and the file cabinet and the closet. I was giving myself 15 minutes. I probably had more time than that, but I was just going to give myself 15 minutes to rifle through the contents of my dad's office. I was 37 years old. My dad was downstairs in the living room dying of cancer, and I was in his office looking for porn. Twelve years before this, I was pulling out of a parking garage of a Hilton hotel at, just outside of Disneyland. My dad was in Anaheim on business, and I had driven up from San Diego to have dinner with him. But this wasn't about business, and it wasn't about dinner. The thing was, I had just gotten myself kicked out of the Navy, and my dad was in Anaheim to set things right. The dinner was awkward. It was civil. The fireworks really got started when we got up to the hotel room. And I remember two things being said that night. One thing my dad said, he told a parable, which was not in character for my dad. And when my dad made an argument, he made it by yelling. But at this, on this night, he told a parable about juggling. He said, life is like juggling. You might be able to juggle a few balls, or you might be able to juggle a lot of balls, but that's not important, because all that matters is the crystal ball. You can't drop the crystal ball. And I think what he was saying was that I didn't have a crystal ball, or I had the wrong crystal ball, or maybe that I had dropped the crystal ball. And he finished up his story, and he said, and I love you. He probably said, I love you more than anything in the world. And that's when I remember saying the one thing that I said that night. I said, yeah, you love me, but you have never liked me. And I turned around and I left. I didn't know it until much later, but my dad chased me that night after the shock wore off of what had just happened. He ran down through the hotel, through the front doors, and down the sidewalk. He actually saw my car in the distance and was yelling, trying to catch me, but he didn't catch me. And a month went by, and two months went by, and then a whole year, and then years went by. And, and I was tired of the disapproval and the disappointment and not being enough, so I let the estrangement grow, and it was like a monster, and I couldn't or wouldn't face it. And I didn't talk to my dad or anyone else from my family for 12 years until I got an email from a sister-in-law that I didn't even know I had. And she said, Kevin, your dad is dying of cancer. Please come home. And I did. My wife and I booked tickets 
from San Diego to Pennsylvania, and within two weeks, we were standing at a hotel or at a hospital bed. The family surrounding my dad, my brothers were there with their wives. I had two little nephews running around. My mom was there, and me and my wife, and we were sharing old family stories. And my dad liked telling stories, and he loved telling these stories to my wife, who was hearing them for the first time. And then he told a story that I had never heard before. It was my eighth grade graduation. And he says he was standing there watching me with a group of my friends, maybe 10 or 15 yards away, and he was observing me. And he says he saw me notice that there was a boy who wasn't in the group, an unpopular boy who uh, didn't have many friends. And he says he saw me leave the group and walk over and put my arm around the boy and walk him into the group. And that's the only time in my life that I ever felt like my dad approved of me for who I was and not what I had accomplished. And I felt like at that moment, and I feel now that story means so much to me because it was like he was saying to everybody in the room, forget it, the past is the past. This is my son. And I'm proud of him. So forget about all that other stuff. And that was uh, Labor Day weekend. And uh, my, my wife started calling my parents mom and dad like that. And they loved it. And they loved her. And we were part of the family. And we agreed to come back at Thanksgiving. And we went home and, to San Diego. And we booked the tickets to come back at Thanksgiving. But it became apparent by the middle of October that my dad was probably not going to make it to Thanksgiving. So we booked two more tickets. And we flew back to Pennsylvania the first week of November. And uh, my mom and my dad had gotten home from the hospital. And my mom had really been caring for him almost on her own for a couple of months. She had a little help here and there. I don't know when hospice got in. But uh, I felt like really useful, really valuable. Like I was there helping my mom with my dying dad. And then my wife convinced my mom to get out of the house and go to the grocery store. And I don't know if I, I don't know what the hell was going through my mind, but I acted on some impulse. And that's when I found myself in my dad's office. My dad's office was where everything was. You had your report card, it was into my dad's office. You had your, your uh, the swim meet, after a swim meet, it was into my dad's office. Uh, something, a big life event happened, it was into my dad's office. And this is where all of my dad's annoyance and frustration and anger, really with the world, was visited upon me and my brothers, and I never left that office. I, I always left that office feeling like a failure. So this, is, this office, my dad's office, is where all of the anxiety that followed me through my teen years and well into my adulthood was. And it was also the place where all the porn was. When I was 12 years old, my older brother showed me my first Playboy, my dad's copy of the 25th anniversary edition of Playboy. When I was 16 and I had an erection that wouldn't go away, I went to my dad's office, passed the Playboy, and some internal magical radar directed me to his, his file cabinet, and I found the penthouse forum, which was the first thing that I ever masturbated to. It was in my dad's office that I found my first pornographic movie. This was the 80s. It wasn't even VHS. It was eight millimeters, three of them. And I tell you that the problem solving and the technical know-how that went into watching these things was like, it was like from Apollo 13, except it stretched out over a whole year. And that's what I was doing in my dad's office. I was looking for the porn because I liked my dad and he liked me and this is what people who like each other do, right? They do nice things for each other and I thought it would be a nice thing to clear out a dying man's office of porn. 
and it was all gone. <laughs> Good. But that internal magical radar <laughs> went, kicked into gear, and it took me deeper and deeper into my dad's office than I ever had been before, and I found him. I found the eight millimeters. They were still there, and I stuck them down the front of my pants. <laughs> And I ran downstairs and I ran outside to the side of the house and I shoved them down into the trash can, the bottom of the trash can. And I ran back inside with plenty of time. This whole operation took like four minutes. <laughs> and I went and I sat uh, in the couch in the living room. And I looked at my dad. Uh, he would die that night. And I looked at him lying there on his hospice bed. And he was at peace. And I had done something nice <laughs> for my dad, and so was I. Give it up for Kevin Manley, everybody. He took the bullet in the first shot.